Hi, everyone. Um, apologies for technical difficulties. Um, so thanks so much for having us. Um, really excited to be here. Um, and thanks for the opportunity to talk a little bit about our team's work um, as it relates to groundwater management in agriculture in the High Plains region. Um, I'll start the talk if I can advance the slide. That's why I went in there. Maybe that's why I didn't remember it. Ah, there we go. Okay, so um, I will start this uh, talk um, by introducing Rachel and I a little bit, as well as our team um, and our research program as it relates to today's topic. Uh, then we'll dive in uh, right into the High Plains region. So kind of talk about water availability and different concerns related to water availability in agriculture. Uh, we will talk about uh, water governance and water policy solutions, kind of like targeting those concerns. Uh, I will touch on the value of water. And then Rachel will talk a little bit more about uh, agricultural water use beyond uh, the High Plains region. So kind of like different trends in irrigation happening in the U.S. and causes for those trends and also what policy needs um, are there in addressing different concerns related to those uh, irrigation shifts. And then we'll end up with a few highlights. Does that sound okay? Good. Okay, so here's our team. Um, perhaps some of you are familiar with some of those faces. Looking at you, Nico. Um, so let me go ahead and introduce Rachel first. Um, so Rachel is here. She'll be she'll be presenting a little bit later. Uh, she's been with the Dorothy Waterman Food Global Institute for the past two years um, as our communication specialist and also research analyst, focusing um, on engagement uh, with stakeholders and also doing analysis related to agricultural water management. Rachel has bachelor's in integrative sciences, and I'm happy to announce that in this fall she's starting master's degree in. Uh, natural resource sciences. Um, and um, I am, my name is Renata Hemshaita. Um, my expertise is in agricultural water management, um, in um, agricultural economics. So I'm a senior program manager at the Institute and also research assistant professor. Um, before I came to the US though, I lived in Lithuania where I studied law. But currently my research interests are around agricultural water management. Um, as they relate to climate change, so mainly drought, also as they intersect uh, with sustainability and finance, as well as a little bit of public health. In our team, we have interdisciplinary backgrounds. We do interdisciplinary research. So I already mentioned um, integrated sciences, law, geology, uh, but the majority of our team um, has expertise and doctoral trainings in um, agricultural and water economics a bunch of economists doing policy analysis. Uh, we are all affiliated um, with the University of Nebraska system. So either with the Dorothy Water and Food Global Institute or the Department of Agricultural Economics or both. And for this, for these projects um, related to agricultural water management, um, we work a lot with the different USDA project, uh, different USDA offices. Uh, so we have a cooperative agreement with the VA Office of Chief Economist. Um, so we collaborate with them a lot. Also, um, Economic Research Service, Climate Hubs. We also work closely with the National Drought Mitigation Center that is also part of the University of Nebraska system. Um, also engage with different private and public stakeholders. So with our um, engagement and research efforts, um, we are focusing on better understanding different uh, drought and agricultural water management policies, um, kind of like as I think it, I think it's fair to say that majority of our projects touch on um, either the value of agricultural land or the value of water used in agriculture. Um, in terms of the region, the majority of our uh, research focuses on the Nebraska region, as well as the broader High Plains region. Not only though, uh, and we are interested in expanding, uh, but you know, we, we have, we are located there, so we do have comparative advantage. Also, uh, there's lots of variation there um, and differences, not only related to hydrology and climate, but also different water law, different institutions and management and the way water is being used. So there are different, um, so kind of like agriculture is exposed to risk differently and there are different um, 
pain points that are interesting to analyze for us. Um, we focus on better understanding incentive based um, policy tools. So we use economic and interdisciplinary analysis tools, uh, kind of like probably it's fair to say that fo focusing on um, solutions that would provide flexibility and adaptability um, in agricultural water management. All right, so let's jump into that high plains region. By the way, a lot of the information, general information that I will be sharing about the variability uh, of groundwater use in the high plains region um, is from the publication that is available here with a QR code. It's not open access, so you, if you are interested and you don't have access to it, please send me an email and I'll be happy to share the author's version. Um, okay. All right, um, so groundwater began um, being used for irrigation in the region around 1930s and 1940s, the era that is commonly referred to as the Dust Bowl, um, because it was hit uh, with a lot of severe drought. And so people began becoming uh, creative in coming up with different tools that would help them extract water from under them. For example, uh, the World War II air engines were used to extract large volumes of water and apply it into, into burrows. And then in the early 50s, uh, central pivot irrigation technology uh, was invented in the region. It became uh, the most popular technology very soon. Uh, of course, the groundwater use started expanding a lot by then. Um, for instance, in Nebraska, by 1959, there were already more acres irrigated with groundwater than surface water because of the technology. And then, of course, more droughts were hitting the area in the 60s and 70s, and so the adoption of the technology um, kept increasing, and also the, you know, the amount of irrigated acres kept increasing as well. So the irrigated land uh, increased from about 2 million acres in 1949, to about 14 million acres in 1980. So that's that's a big in increase in what about three days. <laughs> and of course, all of this water is um, coming from the High Plains Aquifer. And it covers a very large area, 174,000 square miles over eight states, as you can see here in the map. Um, it has big variability. Um, as you can see, also in indicated in the in the picture based on different um, hydrogeology, the aquifer tends to be um, split into three different portions. So Northern High Plains, Central High Plains, and Southern High Plains. And each of those areas can roughly be represented pretty well by um, states of Nebraska. So the Northern, Kansas would be more like Central High Plains, and then Texas uh, representing the Southern Plains. And the variability of hydrology and water management um, in those states varies drastically and it plays a very important role for agricultural water management. So the aquifer right now, well, it's kind of like um, dated in 2015, um, has about 2.9 billion acre feet storage and that includes about 0.3 um, billion uh, acre feet depletion. So all that uh, use increase in groundwater um, mm -hmm. start uh, leading to the region. But again, that is not uniform across the region. Um, so hydrology is different, climate is different, but also water institutions are different. Okay, so let's look into all that um, variation, starting with Nebraska. So Nebraska has, here on top, has the largest um, volume of the aquifer and kind of like the, the biggest part of the aquifer is in Nebraska too. So about 60% um, of it. Um, it covers almost entire state of Nebraska, about 84%. Saturated thickness is, is pretty good on average about 600 feet, but again, it is not uniform across the entire state. We have portions where it's sm smaller and portions where it's bigger. We have pretty good groundwater recharge in Nebraska, and that is a big portion why in Nebraska region, uh, the aquifer depleted on average by less than one foot. 
Um, again, it's not the same across the entire state. We have like the piece in, in orange that indicates a higher depletion. We also have places marked in green that uh, indicate the increase in groundwater flows. And that is part, uh, partially related to that uh, groundwater recharge. Um, we have 8.6 million acres in, in, in Nebraska um, irrigated with groundwater. Um, most of them are irrigated with groundwater. And so that acreage is the largest in the United States. I like to, to mention that it's, it's larger than California for some reason. It's, it's a very big agricultural state and it's arid, so it's, it uses lots of water in agriculture. Uh, most of the water um, withdrawn from groundwater from the aquifer goes to irrigation. Um, it's irrigated through many, many wells, um, and majority uh, is through um, centrifuges. So Nebraska is not free from groundwater quantity issues at all, but um, let's move into other states and see that it's, it's very different um, than in Kansas or Texas. So in Kansas, uh, we have uh, less portion covered by the aquifer. And the saturated thickness is small as well, and there is between 50 and 300 feet. Um, as you can see in the map, we have portions um, marked with pink and red in Kansas that indicates larger depletion. So, on average, from the pre development um, area, uh, I mean, um, times, which is uh, 1950s, um, the groundwater level is depleted by about, uh, dropped by about 26 feet. Um, that varies a lot across the state. So. Um, Kansas has about 2.5 million irrigated acres, so still a big agricultural state, and mostly all is used, um, is irrigated with groundwater, mainly to grow corn, so soybeans, alpha, alpha, and sorghum. Okay, Texas. Covered even less portion of the state, um, about 13%. Saturated thickness, very similar to that in Kansas. It has about 41 feet um, average drop in groundwater level uh, since pre development. So it has the largest portions of depletion. And as you can see in the area, it's, um, it is covered um, by the largest portions marked in red and pink right there. Um, it has a lot of irrigated acres too, and most of them are irrigated with groundwater to grow uh, corn, uh, cotton, um, sorghum, and wheat. So as you can see, there is big variation, variability in the um, groundwater availability issues across the region. Um, it varies due to hydrology a lot. I think generally we can say, I mentioned already, that Nebraska is not free from uh, groundwater quantity issues, but they have, in, in their plannings, they have um, goals for sustainable groundwater management pathways, right? And kind of like working towards them, which is very different from Kansas, where they're working more like from extending the lifetime of the aquifer as much as possible in some areas, and in other areas, uh, and uh, um, working um, on minimizing the depletion or managing the depletion. And in Texas, I think the majority is managing the depletion and kind of like working on transitioning to dry land. And so a lot of that, I said already, related to different hydrology, but also a lot of that is related to how groundwater is managed. So. Groundwater management institutions play a very important role. And, and discussing that portion, I always like to start with um, groundwater law, because I believe that it sets also good boundaries in terms of like what change is possible. Is it possible to change it in the first place? Also, water law tends to be very old, ancient, created in times when water availability was a problem. So it's 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 missing the frameworks that would allow to create more flexible and adaptable solutions. But then there are also creative ways how different stakeholder groups mm -hmm. are addressing those challenges. And I will want to highlight a few of those. All right, so let's look in the groundwater governments in the High Plains region. Um, looking into the water law, so if we look at the third column for surface water um, systems, we have prior appropriation for all the states, which is 
pretty common for the Western United States. And so that is that is the same across all the states. And we're looking more into groundwater. So let's focus in on the variability, right? So we have different different systems across Nebraska, Kansas, and All right. So let's let's look at what they mean for each state and how they contribute to different kind of like issues and how they help solve those issues uh, related to groundwater uh, management. So in Nebraska, we have reasonable use and correlative groundwater rights. And so what it means that is that um, landowners can use the groundwater that they have, they can access it and use it as long as it is for a beneficial use, for recognized beneficial use, right? So um, agriculture, domestic industry in, uh, can be also designated for environmental use. However, in times of shortage, they need to share it with each other. Um, so kind of like there is a yes, they need to use only their fair share. Of course, monitoring and enforcement is not um, in, included in that setup, uh, but the state assigned that portion, kind of like overseeing, um, to local districts. And so we have a pretty unique system of um, local districts focusing on groundwater management. We have 23 natural resources districts. So they have, um, I think, 12 mandates related to natural resources management. And one of them is groundwater um, conservation. So kind of like extending the sustainability of groundwater use. So they are responsible for that. Um, they are pretty unique, not just locally, but also within the United States. As you can see, entire um, Nebraska is covered by them. So there is not a spot that is not, wouldn't be in natural resources district. Um, they are calculated based on river basin boundaries. So it's not, not based on counties, not political subdivisions. And I like to, again, focus more on local hydrology issues and address those. Um, they are uh, governed by locally elected boards of directors. That's also important, kind of like helping to focus on locally um, specific issues. One of the most important things that is unique to the districts is that they do have regulatory power. So they can create laws and they have the power to implement. And they are, um, they have their own, own budgets. They are funded through local property taxes. So they can, they can do that. Um, they do use a variety of regulatory and incentive-based water management tools. And so the complexity and variety of those tools varies depending on the problems that uh, these districts are experiencing. So um, I didn't talk about the climate differences in Nebraska, but um, in the western portion of the state, um, the precipitation is much lower than in the eastern portion of the state. So it varies by like, being there about 14 inches, I think, on average uh, precipitation in the yeah, western portion, and about 34, you can exceed to 34 um, in the eastern portion. So then all these different regulatory tools and incentive-based management tools uh, that are focused on groundwater quantity are more popular in the western portion of the state. And so they do use, um, you know, I have a list here, uh, groundwater use reports, they require to install flow meters, they impose moratoria on well drilling or irrigated acres. They also set groundwater allocations, some of them, and I will talk about them a little bit more. So groundwater allocations is basically a quota, a limit on how much water can be pumped over a specific period of time. Also use um, support in terms of incentive-based water management tools. They use um, uh, administer and kind of set regulatory frameworks for groundwater transfers. Um, there's a lot of collaboration happening um, across different agencies. Um, so they work together, those natural resources districts. They also work with the Department of Natural Resources, which in Nebraska is responsible for surface water management. So that's the overseas entire state. And so why that is important is because in very many places in Nebraska, groundwater and surface water is hydrologically good. All right. Okay, so here I want to kind of like show the distribution of the, the those natural resources districts that uh, implement allocations. Uh, so the green color here indicates those um, natural resources districts that are using currently, that is um, uh, a, re a restriction. Um, the ones in yellow, they are ready to use. They never have implemented, but they have it in their plans 
if the groundwater levels reach certain um, depletion level points, they are ready to, to implement, to, um, to start using those allocations. And the red, um, the ones in red, they do not have in their plans at the moment. And so as you can see here from this map, those areas, kind of like those uh, with stripes, um, they match pretty well with the areas that have highest depletion um, levels. So there are different um, ways to design groundwater allocations. And so first of all, they are implemented because we want to limit how much water is extracted right from underground. So that is important for the conservation goals, that is important for the state's environmental goals. However, how they are designed can have very big implications for farmers profitability. So the environmental goal and conservation goal can still be the same, but how they are designed can be affecting farmers profitability. And so these different aspects, um, my colleague um, Taron Yano is leading research on it, kind of like it's explained in a blog here that you can access through QR codes. Uh, so he's still working on it, but um, key points to consider are total allocation, so how much water is allowed to be pumped, duration of the time, so is it for one year, is it for three years, or is it for five years? So in Nebraska, it's, it's very popular to be between three and five years. So farmer has the total quota, say 60 inches, to use for the period of five years. But then it means that they have the flexibility within that period to use it the way they see it best uh, in terms of minimizing the risk for their production, right? So kind of like seeing when the drought hits, uh, when there is no drought, like how to apply that work. Also, it's important to consider if any unused allocation can be carried over to the next allocation period, right? Can I save it and then have a little bit more in the next period? So it's not a rolling over allocation, it's five years. In, it can and then be. another five years starts, so it's a rolling it varies. Or it varies. It varies, yes. So and, and it and it has yeah, it has implications. Mm. Um, and, and the, the last one is, is the penalty. And here I don't mean the financial penalty, but also like, what is the penalty? What if I'm exceeding my allocation, right? So mm -hmm. like something needs to happen too. Like, will I have a little bit lower allocation in the next period or so? So, so here this graph just shows that um, the profitability increases when the carried over amount is larger or the portion of the allowable carried uh, over amount is, is larger. Um, my other colleague, um, Akansha Malkani um, has been doing research trying to understand how regulations impact the value of farm. So kind of like if we start imposing those um, groundwater allocations or moratoria on irrigated acres, did that affect the value of irrigated or non-irrigated land value? And this is her working paper and just main results. Um, the ones that I wanted to highlight, again, related to allocation is that um, she found that allocations do not have significant impact um, on uh, agricultural land in Nebraska. Um, I think that has important um, and interesting implications for policy and, uh, and allevi alleviate the fears among farmers who are afraid of more regulations uh, coming uh, and affecting their uh, livelihoods. In many cases, also important to mention that um, allocations haven't been binding in Nebraska too. And I'm just emphasizing that a lot of the water that is being applied to grow crops is being over applied. Um, any questions? Okay. Um, to better understand incentive-based water management, I've been looking and studying groundwater transfers in Nebraska. Um, that was also interesting and, and fascinating. Um, so uh, I focused on seven natural resources districts to understand the variability, again, well, water markets are not a new tool to manage water variability, to, to address water risk, to provide more flexibility to farmers. Um, but what makes them unique in Nebraska is that they have been active for a long time. So they've kind of like been tested. Um, they're highly regulated, which is uncommon, you know, when we are focusing on groundwater. Groundwater tends to not be highly regulated in other areas, and they are very there. Kind of like, again, focusing on what's what's the problem. Um, so lots of interesting things I learned, but I think the one that kind of stuck with me the most is that, again, 
in Nebraska, we have a goal set to address, to meet conservation needs, right? So like a lot of the environmental goals too. And so transfer rules can be designed in a way that do not jeopardize that. And like there is a way to um, design the rules for transfers that would account for, uh, say, stream flow depletion factors. So uh, like a different amount of water we would transfer. All right, enough about Nebraska. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Kansas. So we have different um, groundwater law in Kansas. <laughs> Sorry. <coughs> okay, it's prior preparation. <coughs> um, it is exactly the same as surface water in Kansas. Um, so it does. It, oh, I, I didn't mention, but I think it was on the slide that in Nebraska the groundwater system is indicates that water is a public property. So in Kansas, it's the same. Water, groundwater is a public property. But prior appropriation basically means um, they have three three main principles. So seniority, often known as or first in time or first in right, basically indicates that in shortage, um, groundwater rights owners who have most senior water rights have the, the kind of like highest security. So those that have the junior water rights will get access to the water only after the senior water rights holder exercise their right to, to use the water. So oftentimes they do not get to use um, to use the water at all. Uh, beneficial use, so it, again, it needs to be put to beneficial use and use it or lose it indicates that it needs to be continuously used for beneficial use or otherwise it will be taken away the right. Interesting to note that in Kansas, they use it or lose it portion was eliminated, I think, in 2012, because, because it was found that it indicates overuse. Uh, like if there is no way to save, no, no um, incentivization, uh, no incentive to save water so that it can be used for different, different uses. Uh, water law is administered and enforced very differently than Nebraska, so this by, by chief engineer. And so they do have also um, groundwater management districts, only five, they do not cover entire state. Um, also, they do not have the regulatory power. So they do have kind of like, they provide um, like recommendations. And then the chief engineer takes them into account and then makes a decision kind of like whether to implement it. Uh, chief engineer uh, by themselves can um, create incentive groundwater use control areas where also like groundwater would be managed uh, more restrictively. Um, however, that is um, you know, a long process. It requires public hearings. It takes a lot of time. Um, also, it's been noted in the literature that it hadn't been effective. So there are like these uh, areas with the highest depletion levels that are not um, in those areas too. So it's, it's not very effective. Another interesting thing about Kansas is that they have flow meters installed on all the wells, so it's 100%, 100%. and they um, indicate that they have fines and jail time for that violations of those. So kind of like uh, it requires um, landowners to report on them. And I think jail time is up to six months. Um, so because <laughs> these top-down initiatives are not very effective. Um, they have quite interesting um, bottom of initiatives happening in Kansas. Um, so the one that I want to focus on more is called the Local Enhancement Management Areas, or LIMAS. Um, any of you have heard about LIMAS before? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I just came back from Ogallala Summit, and they were they, that included people from Kansas, and and they've been sharing these stories, and I got just re-energized and. We're inspired by listening to them, so I, I I do think that it's a it's a, a pretty inspiring story, and especially how Lima was created, like the very first one. So this it's called Shared at Six Lima. You can see it in the kind of like the top left corner here, and orange little piece. So um, some producers came together because they realized that they do, do want to um, manage groundwater sustainably, more sustainably in the future, or even for the next generations. And the way it's been done in the past hasn't been successful, hasn't been leading to that. 
So they, a few of them, they agreed to reduce, despite the differences in the seniority in their rights, they all decided to reduce their water use by 20% for a period of five years. Um, and kind of like see if it has an impact. And so once that been approved, it got implemented and it became a legal order. So then all the producers within that area, so within the orange space, they had to do the same. Um, of course, as you imagine, not all of them were happy. So there were some, some lawsuits, but, but they were lost. Um, a lot of producers were afraid about losing profitability, but in, in fact, they actually, profitability has been increased. Um, and so right now that um, Sheridan Six Lima is in third allocation period. So it's been successfully extended uh, twice right now. And in fact, more uh, Limas have been created since. Um, other uh, producer-led initiatives are also being born. So there's lots of collaboration that is happening in Kansas and I think that is, that is needed. So another one is uh, water technology farms. So farmers are kind of learning uh, from other farmers um, in terms of how to use uh, better efficient technology, uh, better practices. Um, they work with industry, like that allows them to learn without gambling with economic losses. All right, in Texas, in Texas, uh, where we have the highest depletion um, of all the areas um, in the High Plains region, we have the absolute ownership groundwater rights system. And that um, means that uh, groundwater rights belong to landowners and, and there is no liability. So landowners can drill um, and pump as much as they see fit. The law often is, is described as the um, uh, rule of catcher um, or the law of the biggest pump. Um, it's been recognized as an issue um, and so it, Different groundwater conservation districts um, start to be um, to be implemented in the state. Um, I think starting in 1940s, they haven't been very effective. Uh, I think um, they started to be more effective when they got more regulatory power. So since 1990s, um, they've been kind of like using um, well spacing requirements and permits for groundwater extraction. Um, they work a little bit more like Nebraska's natural resources districts. However, it feels sometimes that it's, uh, it's a, little bit, a little too late given the issues that they have. Um, however, uh, they, they are trying. Uh, in terms of the bottom up initiatives, so it's interesting that the landowners themselves can also um, organize and create groundwater conservation districts. Again, that would take lots of time. Um, Texas Alliance for Water Conservation is very similar to the bottom up initiative in, in Kansas, too, where uh, farmers work together um, with the industry. So, industry provides discounts, provides tools, um, kind of like sharing um, different technologies, uh, learning about different practices without gambling with their losses. All right, so I talk about a lot, a lot about different hydrology and different. different um, Water law and, and management institutions kind of like want to bring it back to the value of agricultural water and to, to the yields. Um, you know, using one of my older studies here, uh, where I looked into the value of agricultural water um, from growing corn uh, from 2010 uh, to 2017, um, Colorado, Nebraska, and Kansas. And so what I found was that the value of water was highest, not uh, where the water scarcity was highest. So um, it indicates that irrigation adds, supplemental irrigation adds a lot of value. And so that means that it, supplemental irrigation is, is going to increase and has been increasing. And so irrigation has been moving to east for the past few decades. And that's gonna to continue to happen. And the, the policy implication here is that in a lot of those states in the East that have been predominantly using rain-fed um, irrigation, they do not have strong water institutions in place. I like to address potential conflicts between different water using um, parties, so say agriculture and cities and environment, uh, but also to address drought or floods and the impacts of climate change. And so a lot more about that, uh, not a lot, but a little bit more about that will be covered by Rachel here as she will be 
uh, talking about the irrigation trends um, shifting and implications related to that. Oh, with the arrows. Keep working. Keep working. Okay. All right. Thank you, Renata. So I'm going to go over some graphics. We're currently working on a series of infographics um, that uh, show general uh, overall trends in agricultural water use across the country. Um, and so we'll start here with this one that kind of illustrates that one of the, the kind of main uh, driver for irrigation adoption is to supplement rainfall or to protect against rainfall variability. Um, so you can see on the left, there's the uh, average precipitation um, at a county level across the country. And you can see that overall the West gets um, significantly less rainfall than the East. Um, and so then on the other more uh, pink purple uh, map, you can see the farmland, uh, this is for 2017, the farmland irrigated by county. And you can see that the majority of the farmland irrigated is in the western um, portion that um, gets less rainfall than the east. Um, so then this one um, shows the change in county level uh, irrigation. So in the yellow, we have areas where uh, there's been a significant decrease in irrigation use from 1997 to 2017. And then in the blue areas, you can see areas where um, irrigation has increased in that time period. And so for the thir first three dots, those are indicating some major areas where there have been decreases. Um, overall, this is largely due to um, there's overall a less amount of water um, available for use in agriculture. Um, in California and in Colorado, they're, um, they have been allocating, reallocating some water rights to more of the urban areas. So there's less water rights for agricultural production um, in California. There's the 2014 Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, um, which is expected to continue to, um, so there's an expected decrease in agricultural water use um, to be continued there. Um, and then, as Renata mentioned earlier, number the number three dot um, in that area, just due to um, a groundwater depletion, there is uh, less water available for irrigation. And then, so then moving on to the other three, which are indicating uh, major areas of increase. Um, number four is Nebraska. Um, and so that increase in this time period was due to um, high crop prices and drought. Um, and so there is a major increase in irrigation then, but um, it is now restricted. There's more restrictions in the expansion of um, adding more uh, irrigation. So this trend is not expected to continue. Um, as I mentioned, this map is for 1997 to 2017. Um, and then the number six dot um, is uh, this area. And so the irrigation is to support uh, the production of the cotton and rice or and corn and soy that is here. And so this is one of the reasons why we're really excited to come here and visit with you all to learn more about the context and everything for agricultural water use here. And then the number five dot is just indicating, as Renata mentioned earlier, that overall there's a trend that irrigation is moving east. Um, and so it'll be important, an important discussion for um, policy and looking for opportunities to manage that. Um, and so this uh, map uh, is still in the draft phase. Uh, we're currently working on verifying, um, just kind of uh, talking to a lot of people that have local knowledge around the country of how water rights systems are implemented. But overall, this map is meant to show the um, high-level overview of the water rights systems, how they're um, uh, how they are throughout the country. You can see um, in the west, it's largely prior appropriation, um, as we not mentioned earlier, and then in the east, it's a lot of riparian and reasonable use. Um, and yeah. <laughs> thanks, Rachel. Um, thank you. So I know we will share lots of information here um, with you, information overload maybe a little bit. Um, so let's just wrap up and just mention a couple 
highlights and open up for questions. So there is um, significant variability in the high plains region um, in hydrology, right, as it relates, as well as in institutions, water management institutions and water law. So a lot of it is related to hydrology, a lot of it is related to how water is managed. And uh, so approaches to looking for solutions for sustainable groundwater management appear to be local context specific, and rightfully so. There are different um, top-down and bottom-up approaches that are being considered, different collaborative um, opportunities um, that are happening, um, and that a lot of them are inspiring and, and exciting as well. And I think um, knowing those um, issues and potential solutions or how they're being addressed uh, can be especially important as we're thinking about and looking uh, into those uh, shifts in irrigation, like what, what problems they will be bringing together with the impacts of climate change. And I will end right here, so thank you. Thank you. Any question in the room? Yeah. Yeah, like you, you mentioned all the like groundwater depletion of the high plains, but I haven't seen like is there any initiatives on like a recharge program initiation of recharging groundwater, like a plug mark. Right. So I, I didn't I didn't mention all the different initiatives that are happening across the area. And I think recharge is, is important. Um, in different states. So, so there are some programs that are focusing on that. Um, I do not have specific knowledge in that. I think that is one of the solutions that is all necessary. Yeah. Yeah. A little bit on your uh, 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 project, uh, and I guess it, it matches your, your background in law and economics. Uh, and I like the approach that you're saying, well, that the law just give us what the bounds of what could be done and, and everything. The, the observation that I want to make, see what you have to say about mm -hmm. it is in, in California, in the uh, uh, California Delta area, we, we were in a meeting, the 419 meeting, and uh, we had a lawyer there that was involved in water regulation and bringing up some lawsuits and stuff and uh, he had a very legalistic um, almost judiciary view of, uh, of water use and governing water use and the big challenge was enforcement and the cost of enforcement the, he was talking about a case of somebody saying yeah okay that's a fine try to collect it Try to collect it, okay, sue me, try to win, win the lot. So it's been a challenge that. And so um given your 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 background and we always talk in economics about this enforcement cost and these other things. Are you planning on incorporating some of that into this project? You know, the the the, the initiatives that I've seen successful have involved regulation, but have been either producer uh initiated or heavy buy-in from from those who would be yeah. subject to, to it. I haven't seen much that could be described as successful coming from from top down in that sense. Yeah no I, I agree. I have I haven't seen much of it. Um, California is an interesting case. It's it's a very complex case. They have very um, big issues right related to, to groundwater availability. Um, and, and SIGMA that um, Rachel mentioned, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act of 2014 brought lots of restrictions to groundwater use because before it was like in Texas, so, uh, you know, farmers could use as much water as they want. And then SIGMA regulation comes and tells them, oh, no, 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 we're going to put caps on it. So, of course, nobody's happy about that, right? And so they, they do try to come, come, I think, in my opinion, as much as I understand it, uh, with a very heavy top-down approach. And I don't think that is going to work. Right. So like the reason why like several top down approaches, as I see them right now, kind of been successful in Nebraska is because they took lots of time to be implemented. So they were like it, they are tested. They they worked, right? Like so of course farmers weren't always happy, but there's lots of education that is happening. And I think that is that is also monitoring and enforcement, that that you know of 
these different um, groundwater regulations, that is key. And for that to happen, we need high, high budget. And I don't think that California um, is, is planning for them at the moment. So I think a lot of the measuring or plans that I've seen um, are based on um, remote technology. And it's really hard to, to measure and enforce and monitor it that way. Uh, so I think that, that that's what we need to change them up. The Natural Resource District System in Nebraska was largely proposed by farmer leaders mm -hmm. that yeah. went to the state and said, we need management. Right. You mean originally? Yeah. 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 I, think, I think at the moment they are pretty, pretty satisfied uh, with how they're working. And the first few people that tried to uh, uh, mess with their flow meters so that they uh that they would undercount for the allocation purposes that they uh they were not allowed to irrigate anymore. Wow. So there was enforcement cost at first. You you scare a few people off. And and they do they do monitor for the well. They have they have budgeted for that. Yes, they go and have monitoring wells, but they also go and check as well. That to me, my question is do they automatically like transfer the data somewhere, or does someone go out and read the meters? They go and read the meters. Some districts have uh, telemetry now. Uh, that's our instantaneous reporting. Uh, some are uh, have hired staff that read the meter every spring. I'm kind of wondering the same thing for Kansas because there's they're mandatory, so you assume the data goes somewhere. Um, they're working hard not to not to share the data with others, not to private. Yeah. It's private because I think that's what producers want to do. Any other questions? Go ahead. Um, can you walk me through again? Um, I'm so perplexed on that study you showed where the profitability or the I guess the value of water doesn't necessarily correlate or maybe irrigation can actually be the highest. Yeah. So it was the, the average value of water applied to grow corn. And so we, we just found that the, 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 value, the average value was okay. highest um, in those areas that were using um, its supplemental. Okay. Right? So it's not those areas that are the most arid, that you can use it constantly all the time, and also not in those times that um, we have the most severe droughts, but just those that use it supplementally because it adds value. I think it keeps like it yields um, more resilient to different um, like shocks, even if they're like smaller shocks in weather. Transition into more permanent one, depending on the impacts of climate change. Mm -hmm.